and uh, welcome to this week's learning space. My name is Nicole Gallucci and I am a postdoc with the Cosmo Quest project. I am flying solo today, so I apologize if I get a bit rambly. Um, but I encourage you to please comment um, and ask questions and, and play along. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, use the YouTube comments there. Uh, if you're watching this on Google Plus on the event page, I'll be posting links there and I can read the comments there as well. And I should uh, be able to see it on any of the posts going out. Um, I'm noticing a little bit of a delay between video and audio as well, I think. Apologies for that. I'm uh, broadcasting from home where the internet's not the best. Um, I wanted to drop in, even though we weren't going to have a show this week, I thought I'd drop in with a quick little broadcast. Uh, talk about some of the work we're doing with teacher professional development. Uh, I'll be honest, I didn't want everyone to see another Hangout window again after our 32-hour fundraiser. I was a little uh, worn out right, right after that ended. Uh, if you didn't see any of that, <laughs> it's posted on my YouTube channel, but it will get posted on the CosmoQuest channel in bits and parts. We did a 32-hour Hangout broadcast a fun fundraiser for CosmoQuest uh, to keep our programs running. Uh, and although we didn't get to our ultimate goal of uh, six months of operating costs for the project uh, so that we could go after more funding since the, ch the uh, thing is changing, everything's changing at the federal level, uh, you can uh, go to cosmoquest.org slash donate to uh, throw in a few bucks if you can, if you, you know, weren't to rest for 32 hours by us. Uh, and then we'll be adding with a couple of other ways that you can help, such as buying a Surly Ronick. So, so my, my good friend Amy, who makes these this uh, science inspired jewelry, uh, will be giving a cut of the cut of will be donating a cut of the proceeds if you mention Cosmo Quest in your order. So things like that. Um, yeah, it come it. Uh, but anyway, we're back to our, our normal regular hangout schedule. Uh, I should note we did make uh, enough money to feed the Joe, our uh, grad student, who is one of the uh, two programmers of of the Cosmo Quest site. Uh, so yay, thank you for helping us feed our grad student. <laughs> That's very important. Um, so this week, uh, so right after the Hangout-a-thon, uh, I got started uh, for the, um, we're doing a professional, teacher professional development workshop uh, for several, uh, we have some several middle and high school teachers in Southern Illinois that have come come out. Uh, one, one teacher's from a little bit further away up in Peoria, um, but we got a, a really good group working with us all this week. We have a day workshop all about Terra Luna. So Terra Luna is, and I'm going to try and screen share the website without breaking the world. Um, oops. Uh, screen share. Mm. Terra Luna is the, uh, the uh, middle school unit that goes along with our Moon Mappers project. So if you've ever been to CosmoQuest, and I hope you have, played around with the citizen science tools, uh, one of them is Moon Mappers. This is the one we've had running the longest where you map surface features on the moon and help our scientists figure out things like uh, surface ages. And so we've developed, um, so it was Bracey and uh, Kathy Costello and Ellen Riley who've been leading the charge to develop educational materials to go along with it. And so we have a section of the website called Educator Zone. You go to Educate up at the top bar anywhere you are. Go to Educator Zone and it takes you here. We've got a blog. It's a little out of date. I think we lasted some posting when we were at the NSTA, National Science Teachers Association meeting in San Antonio. Um, but on the right here is where we have some resources and Terra Luna is the first product that we've come out with. <clears throat> so you can click through to that. <clears throat> Excuse me and uh, find out about Terra Luna Connecting Earth and Moon. And it uh, is a three-week lesson on lunar geology, particularly comparative geology, um, comparative geology between the Earth and the Moon. Uh, so I've got one of the, the famous uh, Apollo 8 pictures introducing it. The whole thing is, uh, you can download the PDF here. We're also on NASA Wavelength which is an amazing resource if you haven't been there already um, for, for educators teaching any aspect of space science. Um, and then so our materials, I've got links to some of the important NASA mat uh, materials that we've pulled a lot of our activities from. 
and built lessons around them. And then I've got a breakdown of each of the lessons. Um, why the moon, origin of Earth and the moon, differentiation. Uh, I've got images to go along, uh, some, some images straight from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, um, uh, straight off of that on our site. Um, and so basically this week we are taking the time with the teachers who have signed up to go through uh, the entire three-week lesson, more or less in one week. And so we are doing full, full days of all the activities and also having some really deep discussions about how they fit into the, the standards. Uh, I'm getting a few comments in. Hi, Todd. Thank you. I've mostly recovered from the Hangout-a-thon. And uh, Project Axicart says there's no delay, so that's good. That would drive me, me nutty. Um, so we're doing this, this uh, five-day workshop and talking a lot about how it fits in with the various si sets of science standards. So some of you out there are using the National Science Education Standards, the NSES. Um, a lot of states hopefully will be moving to the next generation science standards, which have just come out last month or so, two months ago. And the uh, AAAS Project 2061 benchmarks are a set of standards that is becoming popular uh, outside the U.S. And so uh, Kathy and Ellen have work, worked their butts off getting um, aligning this to those standards uh, so that you can actually see, say, hey, I'm doing space science, I'm doing lunar geology, but here's all the standards that I'm hitting that you actually need me to meet. And so I think that that's really useful for, for teachers these days. Um, having never been a teacher, of course, I'm learning a lot <laughs> from, from everyone's stories and reactions to it. And hopefully that's helping us to improve the product that we're putting out. Um, and uh, <clears throat> in addition, there's a lot of tie-ins to the Common Core. So again, if you're a, a teacher in the US, um, many states have adopted the Common Core standards for language arts and for mathematics. And so there's a lot of tie-ins there, and you can do uh, art stories, you can do writing, you can do writing, you can um, bring in uh, mathematical concepts as well using all this stuff. And uh, this is something that's pretty popular over on NASA Wave, like as well as aligning to the Project 2061 standards. Um, all of their materials are doing that. So we're trying to make it so that if you love space and you want to put space in your classroom and you're finding it's difficult because they want you to you know, focus on biochem physics or, or uh, focus on, on um, you know, just earth geology, you can still slip in the space stuff and cover a lot of good earth geology concepts with Terra Luna and uh, also hit your standards. And so, um, so this, so we're, we've just finished up day three of, of uh, the five-day workshop. And like I said, we've been learning a lot about how we can make the materials more accessible to teachers and also how we can improve things in our Moon Mappers um, citizen science website such that it will appeal a bit better to teachers and to students. And we've already got a lot of those things underway, um, such as uh, groups. You can form a group and monitor all the people in your group and so you know who to give extra credit to, who's actually doing the mapping at home. Um, and then we're working, uh, we had a good discussion today about uh, how positive feedback on your crater mapping is really useful and helpful and how we can improve that. Um, not just for students, but for adults. I know when I get the message saying, I've only done 50% of the craters in the image, I get a little discouraged um, because I'm a perfectionist. But 50% um, is not bad, and even 70% is really good. So uh, it's when we collect all the data um, that we're getting something really, really spectacular. OK, but I want to show some of the amazing stuff we're doing at the workshop. Uh, so uh, uh, those of you who didn't watch the Hangout may not know, I did get Google, Google Glass, and so it's charging over here. Uh, there you go. And so I've been using it a lot. I've gotten uh, permission from all the teachers to share uh, photos and video of them during the workshop, and so I've been taking photos and video of a lot of the activities without um, being too intrusive or having to fight with my phone, and so that's been pretty cool. Uh, thank you, SPS Zero, for the comment. Uh, too bad you can't see the video because we're going to show some really cool stuff, and uh, you guys can can chime in, watch the archive version too. Uh, let's see, let me screen share. 
this picture. We, in the middle of prepping for <laughs> out of thon, I was also prepping for this um, workshop, and so this is me. Actually, this is Captain Chuck, the little squirrel guy in the STEM Center um, at, at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville, which is our host institution, uh, collecting all kinds of swag. So if you come to a workshop, if you're a teacher and you come to a workshop, you know you're probably going to get free stuff. So we put stickers, we put solar observing glasses, you can't have the squirrel, sorry. Um, and then flyers for all the stuff we're doing locally because we are doing a lot of uh, things like star parties and um, science camps. Um, and if you skip ahead, we, uh, Kathy in particular, has um, done some work with special education. And so the teachers got to brainstorm about different types of um, ways to extend and adapt lessons. Uh, and so we've got, uh, you can't read the tiny little print up there, but we've got a separate document describing the situation of a particular student and ways that we can extend or adapt the lessons to accommodate particular students with uh, whether it's it's learning disabilities or, or learning challenges. Um, we have, uh, like I said, these really great teachers. We've taken over a classroom in a local middle school where this is Ellen wearing her, her uh, science wizard hat. Uh, we've taken over her old classroom. She's been retired for five years now, but they let us take over her, her classroom, which has a lab adjacent to it. Uh, and so these are our, our teachers that are really dedicated and motivated, and some have already been using citizen science in the classroom. Some of them are new to using citizen science. Uh, they're all pretty dedicated about sharing uh, space with, every, with their students. Um, there are a lot of engineering challenges to be had um, a lot of engineering um, uh, standards, yeah, in, in the next gen standards. Is a, and so we have them doing some engineering activities from the, the, um, the NASA lessons. And so I'm going to try and screen share audio, which means I'm going to shut up for a minute. Uh, hopefully you'll get the audio of this. This is from a particular activity called Launch It where they're given uh, some materials and told to make a rocket out of it and hit a target. Um, and so this is uh, Sarah, who is one of our, our, our participants, who's a middle school teacher. And uh, sh this was her, after many, many attempts and adjustments to her little rocket, uh, this is uh, our, our first success at hitting the target. So I'm going to shut up while I set up the sound. Okay, so uh, like I said, I hope you guys could hear that video. Hopefully I got the sound settings right um, because <laughs> that was uh, good. So we're just, you know, chatting and talking about different ways to adapt and run the lessons, um, them in their classrooms in particular, and um, and uh, then someone's asking me about class, and, and right in the middle of that, <laughs> Sarah hits the target, and so we're all excited um, watching that happen. Uh, 
of course, uh, so we have engineering challenges in there, um, and then there's a lot of geology in particular. Um, let me sh share the pictures again. Uh, so like I said, if you could or couldn't hear the video, please leave a comment. Um, that will help me, give me a little bit of feedback. Uh, so here is uh, an activity from NASA called Reaping Rocks. Um, so, uh, Ellen's watching me use glass through the through the uh, sinks there, and uh, you give give the students. Uh, so I got I, uh, Guido's telling me that the sound didn't come through, so I'll have to play with that another time. Boo! Um, but you can hear the excitement. It was fun, uh, and so uh, we give them different rocks, and they have to classify their. Uh, color and structure and figure out if they're sedimentary or volcanic and compare them to characteristics of moon rocks, which unfortunately we don't have because those are so hard to get, and um, uh, talk about which one uh, moon rocks probably are. One thing that has come through in this is that um, even teachers who are really interested in this material and in, in sharing it with their students don't always have the content knowledge, um, the deep content, no content knowledge that they'd like to have. <laughs> And uh, my background is not in planetary sciences, and so I'm trying to fill in what I what I can. Um, but occasionally, you'll see posts from me this week uh, asking uh, Emily Lakdawalla or <laughs> Stuart Robbins or Irina Antonenko or uh, um, different planetary geologists that that I I know um, to fill in the details. And so that's been helpful as well. Uh, and I think it's really important to keep. This is my little this is my little soapbox moment. Uh, but I think it is really, really important for scientists to have that one-on-one -on -one interaction with teachers in these, um, in these workshops. And so even though I don't know the content material as well as someone who's worked with it and gotten their PhD in that, um, I'm at least close enough to the science and context who have done it. Um, so when, you, when you're doing teacher professional development and you're doing it on some specific science, if you're doing it with citizen science, I think it's really important to have the scientists there and not just come in and give a talk and do a chat with them for an hour and, and move on. I'm sure I'm sure that that exists. I don't again. I don't know as much about teacher professional development. This is my first full workshop, uh, and and there are several that do involve scientists. But I think it, it is really helpful to have the scientists there doing the the activities with them and and training them. And I know, um, gosh, I heard from several people. Uh, at the American Astronomical Society, which I talked about last week, who do have scientists embedded in their teacher workshop programs, and I think I think that really makes a difference because the the teachers are hungry for content um, as as well as as the uh, learning how to teach and working with the standards and doing all of that. Um, like I mentioned, we talked a little bit about how to. Uh, adapt the lesson plans to different special needs and, and uh, in fact Kathy has put a blog post up at cosmoquest.org slash blog about her own experience as both a parent and a teacher of, of uh, children with, with certain learning needs and um, we gave them a hands-on, a very hands-on experience at how that works and I'll pull up those pictures, this is pretty clever um, to some of them, we gave goggles over which uh, they we taped some plastic, and so it was really translucent. So here's Sarah wearing some some plastic goggles that are really tough to see through, um, and uh, a couple of them have gloves uh, with no thumbs in the gloves. The thumbs have been sewn shut. Um, uh, Robin back here is can't see, but she's wearing earplugs and. Uh, she was able to get through the lesson okay, but then we were chatting afterwards about, again, different ways of adaptation, and all of us ended up congregating around talking, and she was sitting by herself, just looking around, and finally she goes, can I take these out now? <laughs> because she'd been left out of the conversation, and that's another demonstration of uh, what might be going on in your classroom. So here's, here's me wearing the thumbless gloves, <laughs> trying to figure out how I would do a lab with some that requires fine motor skills. Um, and not having um, and having some sort of disability, and so that um, led to some really great ideas, as well as discussion of how getting students to pair up and team up with each other and use their use their different strengths um, helps all the all the children in the lab as well. I never had a lab nearly this cool in middle school. I, I can't even imagine <laughs> um, what that's like just to start off with. Um, our engineering challenge the second day involved. Let's see if I can figure out which pictures is the start of that. Involved a lander, so it was called Touchdown. They had to build 
a lander that would <laughs> allow a paper cup to land with two marshmallows in it. And the marshmallows were the astronauts, and they couldn't bounce around or fall out of the cup, and the cup couldn't tip over. And again, they were giving a kind of a seemingly random set of materials to figure it out with. And so they tried different lander styles. Uh, this group put legs on it and added marshmallows to the feet and tried to add some extra corrugation to, to cushion the shock. And uh, this is a, another video, and I'm not going to try and do this sound because you guys said that didn't work, so I'll just uh, talk over it. So that one kind of smacked on the floor and didn't bounce. But uh, they did have seat belts for their marshmallows, and so that, oh, and, yeah, and then it fell over. <laughs> so it wasn't quite there yet, even though it had lots and lots of heat. Um, I don't know what video this is. We'll find out. Wow. <laughs> I think that's the same, the same one. Um, this group found out that the corrugation didn't quite work the way they wanted to, and so they took a, a key from the, lunar, the actual lunar landers and built these straw legs that uh, had a lot of give in them. And so those were a that was able to land pretty softly. Um, in fact, so they, they, uh, this is with the platform. And at one point, they completely discarded the platform and just had the straws attached to the cup and dropped that and uh, to see what that did. This might be their successful attempt at not killing the marshmallow people. Yeah, see, it totally bounced. And try again means uh, I didn't get the beginning on video. So uh, they demonstrated quite well how to uh, cushion the shock uh, of landing. Actually, I'm going to get through these. Um, another, let's see, so there was the cool lunar landers, and another great activity we did was uh, volcanoes. So yes, it, I know it is cliche to use uh, baking soda and vinegar to make a volcano, but it could be really useful for demonstrating how um, different volcanism events make uh, different layers of lava. And so they go through and um, uh, put a little bit of vinegar and baking soda in the cup. Uh, in particular, it's colored vinegar. They've used food dye to color it. And um, it spills out and makes a, a lava plain. And then uh, they kind of draw where the lava plane is. So the previous color was a red vinegar. They draw where the lava plane is and put modeling clay, um, although we discovered that Play-Doh probably would have worked better, uh, but we didn't have any on hand, uh, where that lava plane was. And then they do the next version. They do yellow uh, and, and uh, see how far the yellow lava, <laughs> quote unquote lava, comes out and uh, put that in as well. And so after you've done a few colors, you end up with something like this with all these different volcanism events on top of each other, um, showing um, what could happen from, from multiple events and what that would look like after the fact. And then we even had them take core samples. Oh wait, first I've got a really good messy one. This is one with all four colors finished. So they took a road cut. They used a plastic knife and took a road cut and looked at the layers answer some questions about it, but then we also discovered that you could take a clear straw and stick that in there and get, uh, I don't know how well you can see this, it's kind of tiny in the straw, you can get a core sample. And uh, some of the layers had flipped, um, they hit, you know, uh, a tube that still had vinegar in it, and uh, one of them actually came out with liquid in between the layers of clay. Um, and so this is very important for understanding uh, what has shaped the surface of the moon as well as things that have happened on Earth. I'm going to skip ahead to the last. Um, so I didn't get all of today's on picture and video because I was uh, working on some things on the site. But we did my, uh, gosh, one of my favorite activities, of course, which is impact craters. So you get a tin of flour, you sprinkle some cocoa powder over it, get some marbles, and you drop it. Uh, and so they're doing it. Um, when I do this in, in an outreach situation, I just kind of let people drop it, throw it, you know, make a mess just to see what happens. Um, but here they're actually pretty meticulously dropping. Um, they're measuring the, the masses of their impactors and measuring uh, what height they're being thrown from. And then from there, measuring the, the length of the ejecta. So you can see the flower makes some pretty stark ejecta. Um, so that's a light albedo feature if you're playing along on moon mappers. Um, makes it a, a nice uh, ejector they can measure the length of um, based on the different heights. 
They can make graphs from Uh, sorry about that. I apparently lost internet connection. Uh, this is what happens when I'm home and I didn't ask uh, my roommate to turn off various internet sucking things. But okay, so I hope you're still there. <laughs> I see. I see viewers still there. Um, <clears throat> I've probably lost the comment tracker. Gosh darn. Um, but uh, let's see. Okay, so I was talking about the impact creator. So they measure. The ejecta, the length of the ejecta rays, um, they can graph these these numbers, which is really good for um, your math, your math standards and your, your students' math skills, and then uh, measure the depth uh, and and diameter of the the craters themselves, which is pretty cool. And I'm sure I have a video of a pretty high drop, but I'm not sure if that uploaded yet off of my class, so that's okay. Um, I've got lots of video from this event and from the, oh gosh, the workshops that we did at the National Science Teachers Association meeting um, back in San Antonio, and I've also gotten permission from those participants to share the video. So I'm going to uh, put together, <laughs> I would love to put together a highlight reel of uh, teachers making a giant awesome mess out of um, lunar surfaces because uh, it's it's really fun for all ages. Uh, so I have the YouTube comments back, but uh, I don't exactly have all of the comment threads back, so uh, we'll give that a shot. Okay, I have the event page back. Uh, so hi, James. Um, I have the event page back and the YouTube page back. So uh, that's a, an idea of what we're actually doing this week. Uh, this is, like I said, this is me and Kathy and Ellen who are doing this workshop uh, while Georgia Bracey is running a workshop for the STEM Center uh, for several different sciences um, are involved in that uh, at SIUE and they're doing a two week long workshop for teachers in East St. Louis. And uh, Pamela is doing the um, space and earth science component of that this week. It'll involve building Galileo scopes. And I think <laughs> I, should, I should find out because I may be filling in for her next week as well um, there. But I know that they are working on that. So this is education week here at CosmoQuest. We are working with local teachers um, to uh, share the lesson plans that we've developed and also lesson plans of uh, people we work with. Uh, I know the Galileo Scope project is a, a super, super fun project and again another cool engineering challenge to have the students, you know, get the parts and have to put together their own telescope. Uh, I like to brag that I had to do that with another grad student when I was in Virginia. As the sun was setting, we were getting ready for a star party and we were like, oh no, I have to put together the Galileo Scope. Um, so that is all of that that's happening this week. I uh, wanted to give you guys the update, share some pictures and video with you before they go public. Uh, they aren't actually, the album isn't public yet. I'm going to pick and choose the best of, I think, and uh, also edit together the video on, on YouTube. You know, sometime when I should be sleeping, I'll do that. Uh, uh, keep up with the blog if you are interested in more uh, on cosmoquest.org slash blog. I will put links to some of this stuff as well as... Uh, still owe you guys the links from the AAS meeting, the uh, different posters that I saw. Uh, I'll be up late one night writing and writing and writing. Um, so thank you guys. Thanks for saying hello. I'm glad <laughs> I'm getting comments about how, how fun the Impact Creator experiment is. Uh, it's fun and it's science and it's teaching math skills as well, which is pretty cool. Uh, it can take a, a full lab period or several lab periods if you do the whole experiment. Um, or you can, like, uh, like I use it, uh, just use it as a crowd pleaser, um, kind of an eye-catching activity. So 
Uh, that, I think, is it from us here at CosmoQuest. This is your short version of Learning Space. Oh, before I go, I want to thank whoever nominated us for a Parsec Award. Uh, we, I got an email while I was traveling uh, and almost, actually, uh, almost completely missed the deadline for this. Um, but they were they were very kind and gave us an extension because of the Hangoutathon. Uh, the Parsec Awards are yearly podcast awards that are given out at DragonCon. Um, they are primarily for speculative fiction podcasting, but there is a category called Fact Behind the Fiction. And so we have been nominated here at Learning Space alongside such luminous luminaries and such wonderful podcasts as Astronomy Cast and Planetary Radio. Um, and so we are uh, really honored and thank whoever nominated us. Um, and we sent in our samples, so uh, hopefully we will get chosen for the final round. And if we are, you know, decide if they, it is decided that we've made the final round, it will go to judging by a panel of independent judges. Uh, I'm sure I'll be at the Parsecs this year. Uh, and if anyone's watching, I am uh, from the Parsecs. I'm happy to judge any of the rounds that I'm not associated with. <laughs> I could use uh, a little, a uh, little more speculative fiction podcasting in my life because it is fantastic. And uh, I'm sure, and I'm sure I'll go to the the award ceremony anyway. Cheer on, my friends! I um, was a presenter last year, and that was a good time. Uh, so thank you, like I said, whoever whoever nominated us. Thank you to the Parsec Committee for accepting our our submission a few days late because of the Hangoutathon. You guys are excellent. Uh, so that's it from Learning Space. Next week we will have a panel full of amazing people from Mad Art Lab. Uh, you may have heard of them before. This is uh, one of the Skeptic Sister sites. These people, these men and women, just create amazing stuff. So of course, uh, Amy is one of the administrators there. Sir Surly Ramix. Um, Ryan Consell, who helped us um, majorly during the Hangoutathon in uh, selling a piece of armor and donating the proceeds to CosmoQuest, and uh, also um, putting a lot of thought into our Cards Against Astronomy game. Oh, and he also made, I think it was him, yeah, he also uh, made the uh, Werner von Braun all the way, all the way down image. Uh, so thanks for that. Basically, uh, anytime I want something artistic and creative to come out of my head and onto paper in a way that's not stick figures. Uh, I guess those guys, they're fantastic. So we will be talking about the intersection of art and science with the Mad Art Lab people uh, next week on Learning Space. Uh, so I hope you'll join us for that. Thank you so much and have a good week everybody. Oh, sorry, one more thing. I should give you the schedule. Uh, told you I'd be rambling. Tomorrow, um, Thursday, is the Planetary Society podcast, usually at 12 Pacific. Um, Friday at 12 Pacific is the Weekly Space Hangout. I will not be there since I will still be working with the teachers, but Amy Shear title will be your host, so please give her a warm welcome to the hosting spot while Fraser and I are otherwise indisposed. Uh, Virtual Star Party is on Sunday night with Scott Lewis and Fraser Kane, and then Astronomy Cast rolls again on Monday. I think that is it for the schedule. There's no hangoutathons planned in the foreseeable future. Thank goodness for my sake of my health. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining me. Bye.